Right now, we begin our new series called At the Cross, all about Jesus' victory, His championship at the cross of Calvary. Wow, I'm so excited about this brand new series. I really believe it's going to transform your life. Let's begin by praying and welcoming the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence here right now. Right where they're at, right where I'm at, together, according to Matthew 18, 19, if any two will agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done for them, said Jesus, by my Father, he said. So right now, Holy Spirit, we receive your help and that we pray that you would just get the Word of God, the incorruptible seed of God Almighty into our heart and that it would transform our lives. We know that's the power of God's Word. So we believe we receive your help today in Jesus' name. Today, talking about launching our series called At the Cross, At the Cross. This one I want to specialize in turning, talking about turning the curse into a blessing. Did you know that that's why Jesus came, not just to forgive you of your sins, but to turn the curse into a blessing for you, my friend? Wow. So as we go into talking about the cross, let's go into the origins of it. You know, today we have this wonderful symbol of hope, the cross, right? We have the Red Cross, a humanitarian organization that responds to emergencies, disasters, wars, and basically supplying any major crisis relief. There's the Blue Cross, a national health insurance company. There's the beautiful artistic crosses that we see everywhere, fixed high on places of worship. There's the gold and the silver crosses that we hang around our necks as a piece of jewelry. But in spite of our sanitized, approving view of the cross today, we can never, ever forget where the cross came from. Here's the reality. The cross was a tool of execution thousands of years ago. We get our word excruciating from the word crucifixion, meaning a pain like the worst agony of dying on the cross. That's where the word excruciating comes from. Execution by crucifixion was meant to be the most painful, gruesome, slow, and humiliating death possible. You know, today we know of things like um, a firing squad, uh, the electric chair, a guillotine. We know of lethal injection, and all those things are meant to be more sanitized, humane, quick, within split seconds, if not even quicker. But the crucifixion, wow. That was meant to be the most gruesome, humiliating, long, painful. The Romans had specialized 2,000 years ago. They had brought that form of execution to a specialty where they could keep a person alive for the longest time, suffering and lamenting. Thousands of years ago, the, the Romans perfected this form of execution, and it was reserved for slaves, the worst criminals, terrorists, and even enemies of the state. The victim would slowly, slowly suffocate, possibly have a cardiac rupture, heart failure, pulmonary embolism. Make no mistake about it. The cross was intended to torture and to be such a gruesome death that it put fear in everybody that was watching so that their hearts would submit, so that they would obey the dictator that had implemented such a cruel way of death. The cross didn't symbolize hope, my friend, but terror. It symbolized terror. The cross was employed by armies, dictators, to bring submission, fear, compliance. But my friend, then came Jesus. But then Jesus, look, more than just two straight edges brought to an intersection, it's Christ's victory over the curse. That's what the cross represents. Never forget this. When you see a cross, it is Christ's victory over over the curse, not just over sin, not just over death, but over the curse. I think when the, you see that gold cross around somebody's neck, it's blessed because of Jesus. If you think the red cross is a symbol of hope, it's because of Jesus. The cross on top of the cathedral symbolizes life over death. Why? Because of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. So if you want to really know the details of something, I figure we start right at the why. Why would Jesus Jesus turned the curse into a blessing for us. You know, in life, the why is far more important than even the how. People know how to make a profit, 
But if they really don't know why, if they don't have the right motives, they self-destruct. Isn't that so? People know how to have children, but if they don't know the why of legacy, so their children end up becoming twice as lost as they are. People know how to get married, but if they don't know the why to God's design for marriage, they live in a state of unhappy and compromise. So it's so important for you and I to understand that Jesus intentionally suffered on the cross, that he might turn the curse into a blessing. Why? For you. For you. That's why. Because God so loves you. Jesus' sacrifice was a legal transaction that as God paid the price to redeem you and me from sin, death, and the curse. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 23 verse 5. The Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God has loved you. Oh, that's so beautiful. One of the greatest keys to life in Christ is this. Jesus turned the curse into a blessing for you because God so loves you. Now, how did he do this? Oh, this is so exciting. I get so excited every time I talk about this because we get to have an insight into God's genius of love for us. By becoming a curse in our place, yes, Jesus became the curse so that he might redeem us so that we might be blessed. Look at this verse, Galatians 3, verses 13 to 14. If there's ever a verse you're going to commit to memory, this is it. This is such a beautiful truth out of God's word. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now I'm going to open that up for you and help you understand that. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That means the blessing of God on the very found, the founding father of the Jewish nation might come upon me and you, come upon us in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith, through believing, trusting in the work, the finished work of the cross. Wow. I have to say it again because it's such an extraordinary, phenomenal, amazing gift of God. Christ didn't just die for your sin. You know, when people talk about the gospel and they just, they narrowly measure it as Jesus died on the cross for your sin, they're taking a small sliver out of the greater truth. It's true. It's beautiful. But Jesus did so much more than that. The gospel is about Jesus hanging on the tree that he might redeem you and me from the curse. Wow. Christ didn't just die for your sin. No, 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 no. Jesus intentionally, listen to this. He intentionally was made the curse for us, for you and me. Why? So that you might be blessed and receive the promise of the Spirit. Wow. Truly amazing. That is amazing grace. And when we sing that song, Amazing Grace, that's what amazing grace is about. The cross is about amazing grace. So here are the two absolutes that you and I can take away from what we've already learned. Two absolutes right here, my friend. God wants you blessed. Did you know that? God wants you blessed. That's what the cross is about. Every time you see a cross, know this. God wants you blessed, period. It's His will. Period. It's his word. He wants you to have child favored status in Christ Jesus. That's why he sent his only begotten son. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send some other messenger. He sent his only begotten son to pay this price that you might have childhood status in Christ Jesus. And number two, here's the second absolute that we've just learned. You are under the curse right now, under the curse of the law of sin and death until you receive Jesus who has redeemed you. Those are the two absolutes. Now, talking about the curse, I know some of you are thinking, well, is that, is that really real? Proverbs 26 verse 2 says this, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Did you know that a swallow, they say, will fly something like 6,000 miles from one nest in its migration to another nest back to the exact same spot? The Word of God's telling us right now that the curse is very accurate and precise. Things don't just happen by accident. The curse is a very real thing. 
You see people do, you see what people do to each other on a battlefield and it's horrific. And you have to ask, is the curse real? Wow. We see what sickness does to a helpless life. We see what poverty does to little children, corruption in government, disloyalty in marriage. We see what dishonesty does in the church. We see the love of money, the hatred of the unborn, the lust of, for even more and more immorality. And we have to ask, is the curse real? Children don't need to be taught how to lie, do they? Or taught how to be selfish. Unfortunately, it just comes natural. Romans 7, 15, Paul asked this question to himself. He said, I do not understand myself for what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. That was Paul the Apostle saying that in Romans 7, 15. How many of us have asked ourselves the same question? Sin, sickness, sorrow, shame, lack, disease, death, destruction, all part of the curse. So is there a curse? Of course there's a curse. It's real. But my friend, I got good news. The blessing of God is real. And light always overpowers darkness. From the fall of disobedience in the Garden of Eden to now, the history of humanity has been marked by much dishonor and shame, sin, and all the evidence of the curse. But Christ but Christ has redeemed us from the curse. That's what we read in Galatians 3, being made a curse for us that the blessing of God might come on us legally. You don't have to fake the funk. Legally, rightfully, it's yours in Him. That's the love of God. Because of God's love for you, Jesus turned the curse inside out by be Himself becoming a curse for you and me. How did He do that? By hanging on the tree, hanging on the cross. That's why the cross is such a symbol of hope now, from a form of execution to such an amazing symbol of hope. So here's the gospel. Here's the good news. And you know, the good news is so good because the, the bad news is so bad. Jesus was born of a virgin, 100% God and 100% man. Being born of a woman, he was born of the blessed Virgin Mary. He was without sin. His blood was supplied by God Almighty through the seed of His Word. And the woman supplied the body, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Luke 2 said that Jesus had to grow in stature and He had to grow in favor with God and with man. He walked the earth doing signs and wonders, healing, helping, forgiving, restoring, freeing people. And then after three and a half years of ministry, the religious leaders manipulated the Roman government into crucifying our Lord and Savior on the cross for no crimes or sins of his own. He was perfect, perfect, flawless. But he died the most cruel form of execution ever invented for me, for you. Why do I say in our place? Because biblical law of sin and death says that the only way to pay for sin is with death. The cost of sin, any sin, is death. Look at Romans 6, verse 23. It says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Culture teaches the lie, hey, you want what's fair. You want what you deserve. Trust me, you do not want what you deserve or what's fair. You want God's grace, His gift, His mercy. The world system has tricked humanity into this fairness chant. We don't want what's fair. We want what's righteous, what's holy, what's gracious. The gift of God, that's why Father sent Jesus. So Jesus took our place and He didn't just die. Jesus, they could have took him out back of Jerusalem and cut his throat. He would have died. But no, that wasn't the plan. He had to die on the cross, becoming a curse. That's so important. He was put in a borrowed grave. He descended into hell and dispossessed the devil of the keys of death, hell, and the grave. On the third day, the Holy Spirit raised him up alive and a glorious set him at the right hand of God the Father where he now reigns with a name that is above every other name. Friend, his name is Jesus. And nobody can set you free from the curse but Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus not only set you free from the curse, but free for the blessing. See, he, he didn't just set you free from, he set you free for. 
That's such an important understanding to grasp. So many Christians come to Jesus and they want to get set free from, but they don't understand. You're not only set free from the curse, but you're set free for the blessing, free for kingdom of God living. Praise God. So how did this amazing grace miracle happen? I'm so glad you asked. So glad. Well, we know why, because God loves you. Just take a moment and soak that in. God the Father loves you. Mm. Okay, so here we go. This utterly amazing grace, how God made this happen. I'm, I'm telling you, God is absolutely genius. He is over the top awesome, wonderful, and amazing. Jesus himself spoke about this to the leaders of his day. Now listen, this is Jesus talking. I'm going to bring you to a very familiar portion of scripture, but you want to understand Jesus is talking and telling this about himself, about what's about to happen. In John 3, starting at verse 14 to 16, he says this, he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Did you hear what Jesus said? Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness on a pole, even so the Son of Man, talking about himself, must be lifted up on a pole, on a cross. I mean, it's hard to imagine that Jesus would say, as a snake was lifted up on a pole, you're going to have to lift me up. The Son of Man. He calls Himself the Son of Man. Why? Because as the Son of Humanity, we needed a Savior and we needed somebody to take our place. And it had to be somebody that was a man, somebody that was in a body. That's why God sent His only begotten Son, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So why a snake on the pole, though? Well, here's the deal. The foreshadowing of Christ becoming sin for us and being lifted up is centric to delivering all of us from the curse of sin. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, it was the serpent who deceived our great-great-great-grandmother Eve. It was the serpent. And so God cursed the serpent to crawl as almost the epitome or representation of the curse. But God had a plan not just to stop the curse, but to reverse the curse. Oh my goodness. God sent his own son to humble himself, take the place of mankind. That's why Jesus said the son of man with a capital S, the son of man must be lifted up on the pole and even allow the curse, the sin to come on Jesus. Jesus was made sin, we find out, to take all the sickness, the sin, the disease, the curse upon himself. This is so hard for us to believe and to wrap our minds around because it conflicts with our sense and reason, but that's why it must be understood and grasped by faith. But Jesus actually tells us, that just like the snake was lifted up, so he too must be lifted up. You see, there's a spiritual law in Deuteronomy 20, ver 21, verse 23, that, said, that says this, Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. So in the book of Numbers 21, we have this venomous snake coming and biting the people of Israel, and many of the people were dying. Moses asked God, God, what do I do? These venomous snakes are killing the people. How do I stop the curse? That's what he asked God. How do I stop the curse? So this is back in the Old Testament in the wilderness. And God said, take a bronze snake and put it on a pole and hold it up. And let me read it for you. Numbers 21, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent of bronze and set it on the pole. And everyone who is bitten will look and live when they look at this snake on the pole. Think about Jesus' words again in John 3. Verse 14, he said, as the snake, Moses lifted up the snake on the pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up on the pole, on the cross, to draw all men unto him and save them. Wow. Remember this, snakes are under the curse. They're the epitome of the curse. Resigned to eat the dirt as what God said. God said, you'll eat the dirt. We also know that the law says, cursed is the one who hangs on the tree or the pole. So God Almighty introduced an amazing act of his genius love by hanging the curse on the curse. Isn't that awesome? Jesus 
would take all of the curse upon himself and he, being the perfect son of God, would be made sin and he would take the curse upon the curse and it becomes the antidote for the people and it is the anti-venom, it, it is the anti-curse cure. Now we have Jesus saying, I must be hung on the cross like Moses hung the snake and here's the crucial point. We must look on him and believe on him. We must look at the cross of Jesus Christ, the victorious cross, and know that he's alive, raised from the grave, and believe on him. Let me go back to Galatians 3, 13 and 14 again. I know you're understanding this. You're getting this in your heart. And this revelation, isn't it exciting as the Holy Spirit breathes on this word? You're getting a whole new level of revelation of the cross. Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Christ purchased our freedom, redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a tree, on a cross. In verse 14, in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come also on the Gentiles so that we would all receive the realization Oh, the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. One of my all-time favorite scriptures is this, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to judicially be sin on our behalf, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him by His gracious loving kindness. Wow. God made Jesus sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. My dear friend, it would not have worked. It would not have worked if they put Jesus on the cross without all of our sin, sickness, and our fear, doubt, and unbelief. The perfect Son of Man had to take our place, my place, your place. And that meant He had to spiritually have transferred Onto his person, all of the sin, the guilt, the shame, all of our sickness and our perversion, Jesus bore it all, all of humanity's ugliness and darkness. You get the blessing because he perfectly took all of the curse. You get what Jesus deserves, not what you deserve. We get what Jesus deserves because we believe on him. Because of Jesus, his beautiful sacrifice at the cross, you can be free from all the illegitimacy, the spiritual um, darkness, and be a child of God, blessed. Do you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life today? I know you do. Do you want to live free from the curse? My goodness, who wouldn't? Do you want to be free for the blessing? Pray this prayer with me. Just as I say it, you repeat it after me. Right where you are, just pray this prayer. And I'm telling you, something supernatural will take place on the inside of you. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to the cross. I surrender all of my life. You died in my place. Please forgive me. You conquered sin, sickness, and the curse. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer right now, if that's the first time or if it's a rededication, I'm telling you, you're reborn. God has done something supernatural in your life and in your heart. 